The Disciplined Trader Developing Winning Attitudes Mark Douglas Forward My unique position in the financial community has allowed me the rare opportunity to talk to and question thousands of traders, brokers, and trading advisors since 1979. I am not a broker or a letter writer. I am the chief executive officer of CompuTrack, a company that supplies technical analysis to stock and futures traders. I perceive my position as being neutral, one that allows people to open up and talk to me freely. I started trading for my own account in 1960 and very quickly became aware of the underlying psychological blocks to good trading and money management. This realization has been confirmed by all who have counseled with me. As a result, I sincerely feel that success in trading is 80% psychological and 20% one's methodology, be it fundamental or technical. For example, you can have a mediocre knowledge of fundamental and technical information, and if you are in psychological control, you can make money. Conversely, you may have a great system, one that you have tested and has performed well for a long period of time, yet if the psychological control is not there, you will be the loser. A good trader knows from experience that over a period of time he may engage in more losing trades than winning ones. But money management, and a careful assay of the risks protected by realistic stops, will keep the trader out of trouble and ensure that on the big moves, he will profit. Money management is composed of two essential elements, psychological management and risk management. Risk management stems from the psychological factors being truly understood by the trader and in place before risk is even considered. I would especially caution new traders and market participants that reading and passively analyzing your motivations are certainly a necessity, but the acid test comes with active trading under pressure. Start slowly. Question every trade. What motivated it? How was the trade managed? Was it successful? Why? Did you lose? Why? Write down your assessment and refer to your comments before making your next trade. At all major CompuTrack seminars I try to have a workshop leader address the attendees on the psychological aspects of trading. The grim reaper who kills off your equity and disappears with your profits is not the mysterious and ubiquitous they but a simple misguided you. Medea said just before she murdered her children, I know what evil I'm about to do, but my irrational self is stronger than my resolution. If this sentiment reflects your mindset when you trade, then the disciplined trader is definitely the type of book you should be reading. What a pleasure to read this book. My own education cost me a lot the hard way. I can read myself into the pages, that's me, that's me. Mark has carefully fashioned his book into a comprehensive logical dialogue. It reads as if you are at his side and he is explaining it as a friend, which I know you will enjoy. You are fortunate because you are taking the time now, before you have made a serious mistake, I hope, to learn about yourself and to study your craft. The traders who take the time to reflect and practice will survive and possibly prosper. Preface The Disciplined Trader is a comprehensive guide to understanding the psychology of self-discipline and personal transformation needed to become a successful stock or futures trader. This book will serve as a step-by-step -step guide to adapting successfully to the unusual psychological characteristics of the trading world. I say adapting because most people venturing into the trading environment don't recognize it as being vastly different from the cultural environment in which they were brought up. Not recognizing these differences, they would have no way of knowing that many of the beliefs they acquired to enable them to function effectively in society will act as psychological barriers in the trading environment, making their success as traders extremely difficult to achieve. Reaching the level of success they desire as traders will require them to make at least some, if not many, changes in the ways they perceive market action. Unlike other social environments, the trading arena has many characteristics requiring a very high degree of self-control and self-trust from the trader who intends to function successfully within it. However, many of us lack this self-control because as children we learned to function in a structured environment where our behavior was controlled by someone more powerful than ourselves, whose purpose was to manipulate our behavior to conform to society's expectations. Thus, we were forced by external forces to behave in certain ways through a system of rewards and punishments. As a reward, we would be given the freedom to express ourselves in some desired manner. As a punishment, we 
would either be prevented from getting what we wanted, causing emotional pain, or we were inflicted with various forms of corporal punishment, causing physical pain. As a result, the only form of behavior control that we typically learned for ourselves was based on the threat of pain, either emotional or physical, from someone or something we perceived as having more power than ourselves. And since we were forced to relinquish our personal power to other people, we naturally developed many of our traditional resources for success, the particular ways in which we learn to get what we want, from the same mental framework. Accordingly, we learned that acquiring power to manipulate and force changes upon things outside of us was the only way to get what we wanted. One thing you will learn as a trader is that the mental resources you use to get what you want in your everyday life will not work in the trading environment. The power and control that are necessary to manipulate the markets, make them do what you want them to do, are beyond all but a handful of individuals. And the external constraints that exist in society to control your behavior don't exist in the market environment. The markets have absolutely no power or control over you, no expectation of your behavior, and no regard for your welfare. If, in fact, you can't control or manipulate the markets and the markets have absolutely no power or control over you, then the responsibility for what you perceive and for your resulting behavior resides only in you. The one thing you can control is yourself. As a trader, you have the power either to give yourself money or to give your money to other traders. And the ways in which you choose to do this will be determined by a number of psychological factors that have little or nothing to do with the markets. And this will be so until you acquire some new skills and also learn how to adapt yourself to suit conditions as they exist in the market environment. To operate successfully in this environment you will need to learn how to control yourself in ways that may be completely alien to you. You will also have to learn how to grant yourself the mental freedom to shift your perspective to notice alternative possibilities to getting what you want in the trading arena, regardless of your expectations of how you are going to get it. There are only a few traders who have come to the realization that they alone are completely responsible for the outcome of their actions. Even fewer are those who have accepted the psychological implications of that realization and know what to do about it. Rarely do any of us grow up learning how to operate in an arena that allows for complete freedom of creative expression, with no external structure to restrict it in any way. In the trading environment, you will have to make up your own rules and then have the discipline to abide by them. The problem is, price movement is fluid, always in motion, quite unlike the highly structured events that most of us are accustomed to. In the market environment, the decisions that confront you are as endless as the price movements you intend to take advantage of. You don't just have to decide to participate, you also have to decide when to enter, how long to stay in, and under what conditions to get out. There is no beginning, middle, or end, only what you create in your own mind. In addition to the negative psychological implications that accompany these decisions, you must be aware that even if you make the minimum financial commitment of one contract per trade, as in the futures market. There is an unlimited potential for profit as well as an unlimited potential for loss. From a psychological perspective, this means that each trade has the possibility of fulfilling your wildest dreams of financial independence, and simultaneously presents you with the risk of losing everything you own. The constantly changing price movement makes it extremely easy for you to ignore the risk and tempt yourself into believing you don't have to follow your own rules, this time. Here is an environment that offers complete freedom of expression combined with unlimited possibilities and unlimited risk. If you place in it a participant who is oblivious to these psychological conditions, one who operates from a mental framework oriented toward external structure, constraints, and expectations, then what you have is a formula for emotional and financial disaster. This grim scenario certainly explains why so few people ever make money as traders. Actually, Almost all of those who make an attempt at trading completely underestimate the difficulty and consequently overestimate their ability to fulfill their inflated expectations. Therefore, most, if not all, people who trade inflict some degree of psychological damage upon themselves. I am defining psychological damage as any mental framework that has potential for generating fear. Fear results from any belief about environmental conditions that has the potential to cause either physical or emotional pain such as stress, anxiety, confusion, disappointment, or betrayal. Painful emotional conditions are basically the result of unfulfilled expectations. 
Unfulfilled expectations create a conflict between a person's beliefs about the way things should be and the actual environmental conditions that don't match those beliefs. This conflict is expressed through our emotions in the form of pain that we generally label as stress, anxiety, confusion, and so on. People seem to avoid pain instinctively by building up mental defenses against the intrusion of environmental information that would confirm the existence of any conflict. These defenses consist of denials, rationalizations, and justifications, all of which will result in perceptual distortion. Perceptual distortion occurs when our mental system automatically distorts environmental information by shaping and selectively excluding certain information to compensate for the conflict between what we expect and what the environment is offering us. This will be done in such a way that we will believe a shared reality exists between ourselves and the outside environment, thus avoiding any pain. I am defining a shared reality as a correspondence between one's beliefs about the environment and the actual environmental conditions that exist. If you are distorting market information, you are not sharing a reality with the markets, and you are also indulging yourself in an illusion, to the extent that you hide from the possibility of disappointment. At this point, you would be setting yourself up for what could be called a forced awareness. Obviously, if the markets are doing something other than what you are allowing yourself to perceive, because some, if not most, of the information the markets have to offer won't validate what you want or hope, then something has to give. These distortions will continue until there is such a disparity between your acquired mindset and the conflicting market information that the mental defenses, illusions, will break down. This usually creates a state of shock, where you may wonder how things could get so bad so quickly. In such a situation, the market forces you to confront your illusions of a shared reality, creating a painful forced awareness. At some point in your trading career you will need to understand how all of us, because of our common upbringing, try to control market events through our perception of what we think will happen next and then rigidly hold on to these expectations. This is where you need to learn how to gain the kind of mental flexibility that allows you to shift your perspective to be aware of other alternatives and possibilities. You may not be able to control the markets, but you can control your perception of them in order to achieve a higher degree of objectivity, resulting in a higher degree of shared reality with the markets. As painful as these forced awarenesses may be, they are not likely to deter you from being attracted to the opportunities the markets have to offer. However, the cumulative psychological effect on you will be very negative. If you have suffered through several forced awarenesses, your perception of market activity will eventually become heavily weighted towards avoiding pain instead of seeking opportunity. Your fear of losing money, being wrong, or missing an opportunity will become your primary motivation to act or not act. Now, there are several major problems that result when fear becomes a motivation to do or not do something. First, it will limit your range of perceived opportunities by narrowing your focus of attention, keeping it on the object of your fear. This means that out of all available market information, you will only perceive information that will, in effect, validate what you fear the most. Your fear will systematically exclude from your awareness market information that would indicate the existence of other alternatives and opportunities. As you begin to understand the negative relationship between fear and perception, you might be surprised to learn that in your attempts to avoid losses, you actually create them. Fear will also limit your range of responses to any given situation. Many traders suffer considerably when they know exactly what they want to do but, when the moment to execute arrives, find themselves completely immobilized. Before anyone can become successful in an environment with the unstructured character of the trading environment, one needs to develop a supreme sense of self-confidence and self-trust. I am defining self-confidence as an absence of fear and self-trust, knowing what to do at the moment it needs to be done, and then doing it without hesitation. Any hesitation will only create self-doubt and fear. To whatever degree self-doubt exists as a state of mind, to that same degree you will feel fear, anxiety, and confusion. The negative experiences that result from trading in a state of fear, anxiety, and confusion, will create or add to an already existing belief of inadequacy and powerlessness. Regardless of how hard any of us may try to hide from others what is going on, we obviously can't hide our results from ourselves if the market's behavior seems mysterious to you, it's because your own behavior is mysterious and unmanageable.
You can't really determine what the market is likely to do next when you don't even know what you will do next, regardless of what you may perceive or want. The few successful traders who have, in some way, transcended these psychological obstacles have been generous with their one-line gems of trading wisdom, learn to take a loss, go with the flow, the trend is your friend, cut your losses and let your profits run. To know the markets you need to know yourself, and on and on. The disciplined trader fully explores, breaks down, and then organizes the psychological components of this advice into a step-by-step -step learning process, a process that takes you through the various stages necessary to orient yourself successfully to the trading environment. This book will explain to you what skills are necessary, why you need to understand them, and most important, how to go about learning them. This book is organized in four sections. The first consists of the first two chapters and serves as an introduction. The second consists of chapters 3 through 8 and defines the problems or challenges of becoming a successful trader. The third section consists of six chapters that will give you the basic insight you will need to identify what has to be changed in your mental environment and what you can do to change it. The fourth section consists of chapters 15 and 16 which put everything together into a unified framework to develop specific trading skills. You will learn how to observe market action from an objective perspective, determine where you need to limit yourself, and establish the steps you will need to take to expand those limitations in a productive and psychologically healthy way. Acknowledgements Most people are probably well aware that writing a book is a very difficult task, one that often requires the help and support of a number of people in the author's life. There are a number of people I want to acknowledge as being instrumental in helping me make this book a reality including my parents, John and Helen Yusin, my brothers and sister, Craig, Dean and Sandy Yusin, for all their love and support, Brad Johnson. My partner in trading behavior dynamics, for all of his patience and kindness, Jim Sutton, Bonnie Marlowe, Jake Bernstein, Elizabeth McKinsey, Michael Headley, Steve Skinnick, and Jack Carl for helping me get started, all of the traders that I have worked with over the last six years. Especially Jim Griswold, Jerry Stalnecker, Jack Brasewell, Steve Bianuxi, Mike Gamble, and Chuck Pettit for their friendship and support, Tim Slater for giving me the opportunity to express myself as a speaker and a writer, Rich Miller for his support and being a good friend. Lori and Nikki Marlowe for the happiness they brought into my life, and most of all, my friend and fellow author Kurt Leland for everything he has taught me and for showing me the way. Hi. Introduction Chapter 1 Why I Wrote This Book Since I started working on this book, in the summer of 1982, nearly every dimension of futures trading has exploded in growth. There are brand new exchanges, new contracts, more advisory, and new services, an increasing variety of books and publications, and ever more sophisticated technical trading systems, most all of them with computer applications to make it easy to track the markets. However, even with this tremendous growth in services related to trading, one inescapable fact remains, there is still a very small group of sophisticated traders who take the greatest percentage of profits out of the markets. Making well over 90% of all the other traders net losers year in and year out. In futures trading for every dollar of profit gained by one trader, there has to be an equivalent dollar lost by another trader. If a few traders are consistently making money on a grand scale, then their profits have to be coming directly out of the pockets of the thousands of other traders who very faithfully contribute to their daily winnings. Some of these very successful traders are public figures, but most are only known in the Chicago or New York areas. Needless to say, everyone wants to know what they do and how they do it. There must be a difference between these two groups of traders, the small minority of winners and the vast majority of losers who want to know what the winners know. The difference is that the traders who can make money consistently on a weekly, monthly, and yearly basis approach trading from the perspective of a mental discipline. When asked for their secrets of success, they categorically state that they didn't achieve any measure of consistency in accumulating wealth from trading until they learn self-discipline, emotional control, and the ability to change their minds to flow with the markets. First, I want to point out that self-discipline, emotional control, and learning to change one's mind after making a commitment are all psychological issues that have nothing to do with news services, advisory services, 
new exchanges, or technical or fundamental trading systems computerized or not. Second, from my trading experiences, observations, and research, I have discovered that all traders, both winners and losers, seem to share some very common experiences. Either in the beginning or at some point early in their trading career, all traders experience confusion, frustration, anxiety, and the pain of failure. The few traders who pass through this phase to accumulate wealth are those who eventually confront and work through some very difficult psychological issues about what it means to be a trader, and this process of realization and change normally takes several years, even for the best of them. If self-discipline and emotional control are the keys to success, they are also not necessarily traits any of us are born with. On the contrary, they are characteristics we acquire by learning certain mental skills. Acquiring these mental skills is often the result of a trial and error learning process that can be very costly financially and usually filled with emotional pain and suffering. The biggest problem with a trial and error approach in trading is that most people lose all their money before they get through the process. And other traders who have enough money to keep on trading never fully recover from the effects of the psychological trauma they have inflicted on themselves to ever learn how to trade successfully on a consistent basis. This leaves only a relatively small number of people who make it. All the great traders, both past and present, have found it very difficult to explain what it is they do, how they do it, and more important, the progression of steps they took to get where they got. Many would gladly share with others what they know about the market and its behavior but not necessarily about their behavior as individuals. They would, however, often caution those who sought their wisdom to understand that all the market knowledge in the world won't do them any good until they learned what can be called self-discipline and emotional control, without necessarily being able to explain what they were. For instance, cut your losses short is great advice that is often given as an axiom of trading wisdom. But how do you explain to someone the steps needed to learn how to do that? especially when he is interacting with an environment that is in perpetual motion and will always offer him the possibility that the market can come back and make him whole, if he is in a losing trade. If you take into consideration that his money and self-esteem are at stake and the market coming back is always a viable possibility, regardless of how remote it may be, then you can see how difficult it is to explain why he needs to cut his losses. It is even more difficult to explain how he can do it in a way that suits his unique psychological makeup. The easiest way to explain how to apply this type of wisdom, without actually explaining it at all, is to say, well, if you want to be a successful trader, you need to learn self-discipline and emotional control. I don't believe this type of vague advice was intentional, however, for principally two reasons. First, self-discipline and emotional control are abstract concepts that are not easily explained or understood. We all hear or read the words a lot, but ask anyone you know to define either of these concepts, and you'll probably get a blank stare. Second, today's successful traders started out their journey without maps, signposts, or guidelines or the benefit of knowing exactly where they had to end up, from a psychological perspective, to accumulate their fortune. They had to explore the trading world through a means of self-reflection and readjustment that was very demanding and time-consuming. One could say they more or less stumbled through it learning from each mistake, many small and others that were devastating both financially and emotionally. At some point, they probably realized that something about themselves had changed because the normal kind of market activity that once had a very negative emotional impact on them, like anger, stress, anxiety, and fear, just didn't have that same effect any longer. They must have gained some measure of confidence in themselves to respond appropriately to all possible market conditions because there is a direct correlation between a person's level of confidence and the negative emotions mentioned. Confidence and fear are states of mind that are similar in nature, only separated by degree. As a person's level of confidence increases, his or her degree of confusion, anxiety, and fear dissipates proportionately. This confidence would naturally develop as people learn to trust themselves to do whatever needed to be done without hesitation. As a result of this kind of self-trust, they would no longer need to fear the seemingly unpredictable and erratic behavior of the markets. However, the main point I am making here is that the process of change that took place was in the mental environment and psychological makeup of each individual trader, the markets didn't change, the tools that were used didn't change, 
the trader did. Now, when traders go through a transition in their personal development and learn a new skill on a trial and error basis, it is unlikely that they would keep a detailed record of the steps to that learning process, especially if that process was characterized by pain, anxiety, and frustration. Obviously, if someone doesn't know exactly how they acquired the skills they now have, then, naturally, it would be extremely difficult for them to explain to someone else how they got them. Besides, when it comes to trading, once someone is making the kind of money he had always dreamed of, there isn't much incentive to spend the time and energy necessary to break down these abstract skills into an effective learning process from which others can derive some benefit. Developing educational programs to explain how to become a successful trader requires a completely different set of skills from the skills necessary to be a trader. As will be explained in a moment, the learning process and the kind of personal transformation that was necessary to enable me to write this book was distinctly different from the kind of learning process I experienced as a trader to realize why a book like this needed to be written. One learning process was chosen and the other was forced. What I mean by forced is, I had to lose my house, my car, and practically everything else I owned to learn some of the ways in which I needed to change my perspective to operate in the trading environment effectively. Losing all my possessions was a complete life-altering experience, an experience that taught me a lot about the nature of fear and the debilitating effects it has on a person's ability to trade effectively. The kind of insight I gained as a result of this experience is the type of learning process I call a forced awareness. This is where the nature and characteristics of the environment I was operating in were much different from what I believed they were, first out of ignorance, and because I put up mental defenses to block my perception of certain information. Eventually I was forced by the markets to acknowledge many things about myself that I otherwise wouldn't consider. When all the external symbols that represented a major part of my identity were gone, I didn't have any other choice and was forced to perceive myself in new and different ways. These events occurred in March 1982. At the time, I was an account executive with Merrill Lynch Commodities at its Chicago Board of Trade office. Less than a year before, in June 1981, I moved from the suburbs of Detroit where I was enjoying, at least financially, a very successful career in commercial property and casualty insurance. I left Michigan and success to move to Chicago and be a trader. I went to work for Merrill Lynch because I didn't have enough money to buy a seat at the Board of Trade or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and didn't know that you could lease seats at that time. I had an expensive apartment on the Gold Coast of Chicago and a Porsche, I was maintaining a house in an affluent suburb of Detroit that my girlfriend and her two daughters were living in, and I was driving or flying back and forth between the two cities almost every weekend to visit them. I was under extreme financial pressure to succeed because my lifestyle expenditures were far and away in excess of what I could afford. Unless I made it big as a trader, it would be very hard to reconcile some of the decisions I made to put myself in that kind of a situation. By the time I moved to Chicago I had already been trading for over two years. Twice, before moving, I lost all my trading capital. Of course, I would quickly save up and start again. My brief periods of success and few winning trades were enough to justify that I continue trying. Once I was very close to making over a quarter of a million dollars on a trade, but I pulled out of it just before the big move. This devastated me, but I also became completely hooked on trading and even more determined to be successful. From that experience I decided to buy all the books I could get and attend all the seminars I could afford. Something stated in virtually all the books I read was that it is very difficult to learn how to trade or sustain any success if one is under a great deal of financial pressure meaning don't expect to become a successful trader if you have limited trading capital or if you are trading with money. You can't afford to lose. I was obviously violating both these rules because I had very little trading capital relative to my lifestyle that I absolutely could not afford to lose. Also I had a lot of other evidence that the odds were not exactly in my favor. I came to Chicago because I believed that if I could get close to the action and meet people who knew how to trade, I could then learn from them. I was in for a very rude awakening. I was at Merrill Lynch Commodities, its second largest commodity office, with 38 account executives. At first I was shocked to find out only one of the account executives had any experience trading his own money. Then I was further shocked to learn that none of these account executives had any customers who were making any money. 
In fact, the typical customer lost his original stake within an average of four months. My next major disappointment came when I began to meet and make friends with as many floor traders as possible, believing that if the guys up in the offices don't know how to make money, the floor traders certainly must. Again, I found the same conditions that existed up in the offices. Other than a handful of floor traders who had a reputation and a mystique that everyone seemed to be in awe of, I couldn't find one person who was making money consistently, who wasn't confused or knew what he wanted to do and then did it. Without first having to ask everyone around him for confirmation that he was doing the right thing. I am not implying that I didn't meet traders who at some point in the day hadn't made money. They just couldn't keep it. I knew many traders who could make $2,000 or $3,000 the first couple of hours of trading. But they would always lose it back, plus more, a short time afterward. Everybody seemed to be suffering from the same kinds of problems and mistakes that nobody really recognized as problems. Obviously, the nature of the markets made it easy not to have to confront anything that otherwise might be perceived as a problem because the next trade always had the possibility of making everything else in one's life seem irrelevant. Why deal with anything if the next trade can make you rich? All the traders I knew, including myself, were affected by this type of big trade mentality. In fact, my big trade mentality was so pervasive that I would refuse to take profits of $500 or $750 in many trades even when I knew that's all there was to be made. This may sound absurd, but I wouldn't take profits of such small amounts, because, at that time, it felt as if the market was insulting me by offering such paltry sums compared to what I needed or expected. As my financial problems grew, so did my desperation. And I certainly wasn't comforted by anything I saw going on around me. But I still held on to the belief that I could trade out of these difficulties. That is until March 1982, by then it was all over. A mere eight months after moving to Chicago to pursue my dreams of financial independence, I had nothing left except my job, apartment, clothes, a television, and a bed. Practically overnight, almost all the symbols that validated my identity were gone. What I mean is, a big part of my self-concept was made up of my possessions like my house, my car, and especially my credit. Maintaining flawless credit was something I had always been proud of. Now I found myself without any of these things. As I've already pointed out, it's not as if there hadn't been plenty of evidence to suggest the possibility of this happening, because there had been. But there was a part of me that wouldn't allow a direct confrontation with this evidence or the implications. It was just too easy to make excuses for all the things going on around me that didn't add up. Refusing to confront or consider the implications of all the conflicting information created a great deal of stress. And to compound the situation, I had this intense fear that I would lose everything. But again, I did everything possible to hide this fear and put it somewhere in my mind where I couldn't feel it. Yet, there must have been a part of me that sensed my impending fall. Why else would I have been so consumed with fear? But how could I face any of this when I had no way of reconciling the imbalance that losing all of these things would create? What I mean is the imbalance between what I believed about myself and the things that validated these beliefs. Who would I be after all these things were gone? Well it didn't take me very long to find out. As my financial condition deteriorated to critical levels, my mental defenses also began to break down. I eventually accepted the inevitability of doing what I believed was the ultimate act of failure and filed for bankruptcy. There were a lot of things that changed inside of me as a result of this experience. And like anyone else forced to deal with major changes in his or her life, I learned a lot about myself. The first thing that happened, which was quite surprising, was that the stress dissipated. Actually I was overcome with a great sense of relief with nothing to anticipate, dread, or try so desperately to defend against. I was living through my worst fear and found there really wasn't anything about the situation that I couldn't deal with. It wasn't nearly as bad in reality as I imagined it would be. I was still alive and healthy, I was able to think and function, and I started to appreciate my ability to think as my greatest asset. This sense of appreciation began to grow into a deeper level of understanding about the basic nature of my identity. For the most part, I grew up believing that who I was consisted of the things that I owned. The 
more possessions I owned, the more of a person it made me. What I began to realize is that I was more than the things I had accumulated. When the facade was stripped away, it allowed me to sense this deeper dimension that, up to this point, I had only the slightest inkling of these new awarenesses, in turn, helped me understand how being wrong and losing something didn't in any way diminish me as a person. I was beginning to learn that there was a certain freedom in granting myself permission to be wrong and maybe there was no such thing as a failure, unless something positive and useful isn't learned from the experience. However, I didn't relate these personal experiences because I thought they were particularly unusual, except for one. Everyone knows there are many traders who lose everything they own, and even though some of them will come to the same kind of awarenesses about themselves, they wouldn't necessarily be able to do it as a trader considering the financial requirements. I, too, was not in a financial position to keep on trading, except that I still had my job at Merrill Lynch. In fact, for me it was business as usual, as if nothing at all had happened. I certainly wasn't about to announce to my customers or anyone in the office that I had just filed for bankruptcy. My job as an account executive was one of the few things I had left, and as far as I was concerned, it depended on me being a good trader. This is the one key difference for me that ultimately lead to the creation of this book. I was fortunate enough to be able to keep on trading, although not with my own money, while these major psychological changes were taking place. Putting me in a unique position to examine and study the various ways in which the condition of my inner psychological environment affected what I experienced in the outer physical environment. This relationship between inner and outer isn't always that apparent but in this situation it was inescapable. I learned that the markets offer the trader an opportunity to profit from price movement, and these opportunities are basically in perpetual motion. It is an environment where the individual has the freedom to create his own results, unimpeded by many of the constraints that exist in everyday social life. These never-ending opportunities make the market a perfect mirror of the trader's attitude. What the trader sees in that movement and what he can do about it the markets have no control over. All the choices and all the power to turn these choices into experience reside in the mind of each trader. For example, if I perceived the market as a threat, afraid of what it might take away from me, it wasn't because the outside conditions were actually threatening me in some way. It became very apparent to me that my fear was a result of my inability to anticipate events or act in a way that most appropriately served my best interests. It was only the lack of trust I had in myself to do what needed to be done that I was really afraid of. Furthermore, I discovered that my mental framework was structured to avoid losses at all costs and in my desperate attempts to do so, I actually created them. You can think of it this way, none of us has the mental capacity to be aware of everything going on in the environment at once. The environmental information we focus our attention on, out of all that exists, will be the information that has the most importance to us. As we allocate more and more of our attention to certain kinds of information, because of its importance, we are at the same time systematically excluding other types of information from our awareness. I created my losses instead of avoiding them simply because I was trying to avoid them. Instead of being positively focused on market information that would indicate the potential for opportunity, I was more concerned with information that validated what I feared the most. As a result, a great deal of market information pertaining to other possibilities and opportunities that existed in any given moment completely escaped my attention, passing me by. The only way I could have perceived these opportunities, other than after the fact, would have been to let go of whatever was causing me to divert my attention away from what was happening in the market now. I had no way of knowing what I was missing out on until my beliefs about the significance of losses and being wrong started changing. Once this shift in perspective occurred, I started to notice behavior characteristics of the market and relationships between those characteristics that I was otherwise totally oblivious to. At some point, I realized that because I had already lost everything, I really didn't have anything to fear, and, as a result, I inadvertently learned one of the most important lessons to becoming a successful trader, how to accept a loss without any negative consequences. No guilt, anger, shame, or self-punishment. As my fear of losing dissipated, I was seeing and experiencing a different market because I was different. It was as if someone had removed blinders, which I didn't know existed, from my eyes. 
Up till then, my trading had always been affected by my fears. I didn't have the slightest notion of what it would be like to trade without fear or that doing it was even a possibility and least of all, that it was, in fact, necessary to be successful. What also became very apparent to me was the extent to which all of my fears had effectively blocked me from understanding why it was so absolutely necessary to have some clearly defined trading and money management rules that must be followed. It was all starting to make sense. The more I followed my rules the more I trusted myself. The more I trusted myself the more I could focus my attention on subtle relationships in the market's behavior to learn new things about the market helping me become a better trader. Eventually I could gauge the positive effects these new attitudes had on my ability to shift my perspective and flow with the markets. The less I cared about whether or not I was wrong, the clearer things became, making it much easier to move in and out of positions, cutting my losses short to make myself mentally available to take the next opportunity. By June 1982 I was starting to make consistent money for my customers who relied on me for their trades. Not a lot of money by most traders' standards, but steady. I was having winning days that were turning into winning weeks and months. Then sometime in August 1982 I thought of writing a book or at the very least developing a seminar to explain to other traders what I had discovered for myself. In the area of education there was a definite void in the market. There really wasn't any material that addressed trading psychology at a deep enough level of insight to effectively help someone understand why success was so elusive. I wrote this book to address what I believe is a critical need for people who want to trade the futures of stock markets to have an organized, systematic, step-by-step -step approach to learn the mental skills necessary to accumulate wealth as a trader. The secret to this approach is learning a new thinking methodology.